So, time for the press preview then. It's our first chance to check out Sunday's front pages. And tonight, uh, we'll do just that with the journalist and author, Rachel Shabby, who's joined by the political commentator, Benedict Spence. Great to see you both. Uh, we'll chat in a moment after we've had a look at those front pages. Beginning with the Mail on Sunday, leading with revelations, protesters are plotting to disrupt the King's coronation using rape alarms. While the front of The Observer looks at the fallout of Dominic Raab's resignation this week, the headline, Tory plan to politicise civil service after Raab scandal. Activist civil servants target Sweller is the headline of The Sunday Express. And the front of The Telegraph also leads on the Home Secretary with the headline, Braverman, I'm ready to defy judges on migrants. The Sunday Mirror features a report about Boris Johnson's latest holiday, his fourth vacation since resigning as Prime Minister. MI6 spy sent to jihadist camp killed own child, reads the front of the Sunday Times. And the Daily Star leads on tributes to star Barry Humphreys, also known, of course, as Dame Edna Everidge. Their headline, Goodnight Possums, of course. Uh, and don't forget, you can scan the QR code that you see on screen during the programme. Check out the front pages of Sunday's papers while you watch us discussing them. And to do that, Rachel Shabby and Benedict Spence. How lovely to see you this Saturday evening. Lots to discuss, um, both of you. Uh, why don't we start, Rachel, with the front of The Observer. And as we were just saying, the fallout from Dominic Raab's resignation uh, continues. Well, that's right. And it's important to remember in this um, blizzard of front page stories in uh, conservative supporting newspapers that civil servants have done nothing wrong. Civil servants have every right, as do all of us, to work in a workplace that is free from bullying and any form of har harassment. And Dominic Raag was found by an internal um, official inquiry uh, to have been engaging in um, humiliating, insulting uh, behaviour in several of his posts. So that's the important context. Uh, but in that context, the Observer is reporting, um, it's carrying a story from a former cabinet of office minister, Conservative Francis Maud, who is saying, well, <laughs> we should not shy away from political appointments to the civil service. So what they're essentially saying is, and some of the other newspapers are carrying stories along, these theme, along this theme, um, that civil servants are preventing government from, from doing their work, uh, which manifestly is not true. Um, but it seems to be that the government now is focusing on removing the sort of checks and balances that we have in this country um, and a part of a functioning democracy. One of them is a civil service. Another is a judiciary, which again, we're gonna be looking at stories um, around doing away with elements of that as well. But that seems to be the focus very much uh, across some of, across these stories in tomorrow's papers. OK, um, well, let's have a look at the front of the Sunday Express because their headline is uh, activist, in inverted commas, Benedict, civil servants target Suella. We know that out of those eight mm. complaints, only two were actually upheld. W would you agree with Rachel then that, that no reform is, is necessary of the civil service? <laughs> Uh, no, I wouldn't agree. I disagree with Rachel, the idea that the civil service is uh, performing its duties necessarily to how it should be doing. And I would point to the rate at which uh, the, the country is able to process uh, refugee applications as being a very good example of that. Uh, now, that can be because potentially some people aren't very good at their jobs, but equally it could be because the civil service is not being given the resources that, it's ne that it needs. You know, you can say that the civil service isn't doing its job without necessarily saying that civil servants aren't good at their job. You know, there are things, those are two di very different things. The front page of the Observer suggesting that the Conservative Party or the government want to politicise uh, appointments. I think what Francis Maud said is it's a question of getting people in who are effective. Um, but you can see, certainly given how this government has behaved in the past, how that could end up in uh, positions being politicised and uh, potentially people being given jobs based uh, not on how good they are, but on who they who they know. But you know, the warning you would have to give to the Conservatives then is if you want to free up 
uh, uh, appointments to jobs, be careful what you wish for, because you know we only have about 18 months until there's likely going to be a general election, and the odds are that Labour will win that general election, uh, at which point if you've then changed the rules to make it easier to put your mates into uh, positions of authority, uh, you could have the rug pulled from under you very quickly, and things might go in a very different direction to how you want. Now, when it comes to Suella Bravman and suggestions that there are civil servants out to get her, I would say if Suella Bravman is good at what she does, and the Prime Minister considers her to be essential at what she does, then she should have no real qualms about civil servants going after her because the prime minister will bat those things away unless she's, you know, uh, accused of really egregious breaks of the rules and is found to have done that. Uh, that's the way that politics works. If somebody is particularly useful to you, you get a little bit more leeway. The fact of the matter is, Dominic Raab ultimately wasn't very good at any of the jobs that he'd had. And I think, you know, we'll touch on the Sudan story later. Uh, but I think, you know, going back to the to the Afghanistan debacle, really, the question should be not so much whether or not he was a bully in office, whether or not he should have had some of the jobs that he actually had, whether he was in a position to turn around to civil servants and tell them what they should have been doing when he has been proven fairly regularly to have been pretty inept at a lot of his positions. Yeah, and of course he uh, he uh, was very confident that he'd be found uh, innocent of, of, of these charges, and, and said to Sophie Ridge here on on Sky News that uh, he would resign if it was uh, uh, felt that he had been a bully. And of course, um, so it has uh, come to pass. He's had to stick uh, by his word. Let's move on to another story about Suella Bravman in front of the Sunday Telegraph. Uh, Rachel, she's ready to defy judges on migrants. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I would just point out gently that, what, of course, one can be both inept and a bully. Um, but moving on, <laughs> moving on to Suella Braverman. Um, she wants to... <laughs> I'm saying nothing, I'm sorry. Just, <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> probably best, probably best. On, 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 uh, to the on to the Telegraph front page. She... Um, wants to get her illegal migration bill through. Uh, it is going through um, another round, or probably the final round, um, in, in the House of Commons this week. And she is determined that the deal she cut with Rwanda, very dodgy deal, uh, not a safe place at all. Um, she wants that to go through. And so she says now that she is prepared to ignore um, European judges, so that's at the European Court of Human Rights, in order to start those deportation flights. It's not really clear how she's going to do that um, or, indeed, how she's going to get that through Parliament. Um, and it's obviously worth pointing out that <laughs> we have many crises in this country, the cost of living crisis, the NHS is on its knees, uh, social care is on its knees. Um, there are many, many, many things that the government is failing at. What we do not have is an immigration crisis. Most, refuge most refugees, most asylum seekers, 86% end up in neighboring countries to the ones that they are fleeing from. And most of the refugees and asylum seekers who come to Europe uh, do not come to the UK. In fact, you know, France, just as an example, had three times more than the UK last year. So it is not a problem. Uh, there is a problem with people smuggling and putting, um, you know, forcing migrants to take incredibly perilous and dangerous journeys um, at the hands of exploitative people smugglers in dangerous boats across the channel. But that is because there are no regular safe routes available. So we could certainly look at that, but we do not have a crisis anywhere near the scale the government is suggesting. And the reason that they are pushing this point so hard is that they don't wanna tackle or they aren't able to tackle any of the other real crises that the UK is actually facing. OK, Benedict, your thoughts on this? Uh, I mean, on the subject of whether or not we have safe routes, we do have some safe routes, but it depends where you're coming from. You know, we have a perfectly uh, safe set of routes for people that are coming from Ukraine. We have hundreds of thousands of people, uh, over 100,000 people in this country who have come from Ukraine, and they had very few problems. Theoretically, we have a safe system for people that come from Afghanistan. The problem is, to go back to the question of civil service reform, it doesn't work. That's the problem. We set up 
um, a safe route, the Arab scheme, but very few people can actually travel on it. So you've got thousands of people currently trapped in Pakistan who are eligible for the Arab scheme, but who have no means of getting here. So it's all very well, Sula Bravman saying, we're going to set up safe, you know, safe routes as part of this illegal migration bill. But we've had this in the past. It doesn't necessarily mean that the routes work, that they are effective. So it's all very well hearing that, it, it, but putting it into practice is another thing. And I think Broadly speaking, on the subject of illegal immigration and immigration in general, you know, we had a net increase of half a million people into this country last year, many of them, most of them, of course, uh, economic migrants. And the pressures that they put on are not because they are just people coming from abroad. It is because we don't have the capacity in this country. Why? Because we don't invest in things like housing, like services. So you know, where you get the issues is not necessarily because people are coming over here and they're sort of kicking their heels, they have nothing to do. It is actually, as, as Rachel says, there are many issues in this country that are affecting people who are already here, who are coming over, things like, you know, can they get housing, can they get places at schools? And that all comes down to government planning over a longer period of time. Now, if you solve these issues, it's going to be a lot easier to bring refugees from Afghanistan or other places and to help them settle. But if you're sort of, you know, scrabbling about going, oh, well, you know, uh, people who are already in this country are very unhappy at the way that the NHS is working, uh, the way that schools are working, infrastructure breaking down, short shortages um, of, of food, you know, electricity, potential blackouts that we had um, early, earlier on in the year, then, of course, that's going to be a problem. And it does make sense then for the, for the government to turn around and try and find a way of distracting us from all of this. Sorry, I can hear that you're about to interrupt me. I'm no, I was just going to say very bit. quickly <laughs> in a sentence, is Rwanda the right way to do that, though? No. <laughs> OK, well, that was a very short Bye. sentence. Well done. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thank you both. Stay where you are. Uh, we're going to go to a break, after which we'll be taking a look at some more papers, including the coverage of the death of Dame Edna Star Barry Humphreys. The front of the star says, quite simply, good night, possums. Discussing that in a couple of minutes. Follow the sweet sound of birdsong on Sky Arts. And discover the pleasure of painting in nature. Oh, oh, oh it's gone. Join us, Jim and Nancy Meyer. Along with some famous friends. You're in a wildlife, right? Yeah. I knew it. <laughs> As we go on an ornithological adventure. With a paintbrush. Oh, oh wow, yeah. This is the best job I've ever had because it's everything that I love. Art. Birds and you. <laughs> Painting Birds with Jim and Nancy Moyer. Wednesdays on Sky Arts. I spent the last seven years of my life living out my wildest dreams. I'm coming for everything. Maybe you deserve to find out. Available now to buy or rent in Sky Store Premiere. My best friend is in danger and you have to help me. Super Pets, activate! DC League of Super Pets, available now on Sky Cinema. Uh-uh, uh, not yet. There's but the moon. It's true, I can feel the love, can you feel it too? Quality ingredients for special moments. Where's you, Mark? There you are. It's a new moon, Eid Mubarak. Food Love Stories, brought to you by Tesco. Stiga presents the new autonomous robot mower. It's cable-free. Artificial intelligence in the garden. Guided by AGS technology. Stiga. Garden care. I've been a stunt performer and coordinator for over 15 years now. And that external pair of eyes for all the performers on set. Having control psychologically is essential. When you're doing a big movie, there are all sorts of external pressures, but you just have to, in your mind, go somewhere comfortable. Fire is an element you cannot mess with. At Victoria Plum, it's all about you. With free delivery on over 13,000 items, it's never been easier to get your perfect bathroom. 
It's no wonder our customers rate us excellent. And with our bespoke design and installation service, we can even do all the hard work for you. Victoria Plum, it's all about you. Say hello to Chase, the digital bank that makes every day rewarding. What does that mean? Well, you get 1% cash back on your everyday debit card spending. Like on this coffee? Absolutely. Why has my debit card got no numbers on it? All your card details are stored in the Chase banking app, so no one else can see them. Will I be speaking to a robot if I call customer service? Nope, just a few taps of the Chase banking app and you're through to a real person. Oh. Sorry. So, who are you again? Chase. We're a digital bank that's already trusted by millions of customers in the US. How many millions? Well, over 56 millions. Blimey. Say hello to rewarding banking. Chase. Hello again, part two of the press preview. Uh, Rachel and Benedict are still with us, uh, having a look at the front of the Daily Star and plenty of tributes, of course, to Barry Humphreys and uh, the headline there that we were all expecting, Rachel, good night, possums. I was reading that Rob Brydon um, saw him in hospital in the last few days and said he, he was making him laugh right until the end. Well, yeah, and his family... Uh, said something similar as well, that he was just completely himself until the end. And look, it's been incredible reading these, uh, some of these obituaries and tributes, because it is clear that this extraordinary talent did have a full life, a full professional life. You know, he did so much, this actor, this comedy genius, uh, author, um, and did so much globally and touched so many people globally. And it's been it's been interesting just to sort of refresh or remember what why what was so funny, you know, this what was so amazing about his sort of comedy genius and just dipping into a few of the clips. Um, and uh, a personal favorite of mine involves um, an interview on Lorraine involving um, a koala bear, a, a cameraman and and a gum nut, and I think I probably will leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just this acidic wit and incredible comedy timing um, just made him hilarious and, and, of course, will be deeply missed. Yeah, I interviewed uh, Dave Medner about 10 years ago, and it was hilarious but also incredibly rude, and we could only broadcast about 5% of it, <laughs> Benedict, um, because it was so shocking. But um, uh, uh, Dave Medner was brilliant at those put-downs, and the... Double entendre. Yes, and I mean, uh, the, the, the clip that's been doing the round online is, of course, the one uh, where he was on the sofa of, uh, I think it's Good Morning Britain or something like that, and he very deliberately pretends to mistake uh, Dermot O'Leary for Kevin Schofield, and the, the, the entire studio sort of collapses with laughter. Um, or, of course, the clip of him at the Royal Variety performance uh, with uh, then Prince Charles, now King Charles. You know, there are many examples of him... Uh, being just able to deliver those comic lines with just sort of perfection and the mannerisms just being so on point. I mean, the favourite thing that I remember him for is that he was the only redeeming feature from the generally dreadful Hobbit films where he played the Great Goblin with the CGI. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a you know, fantasy film, big, big box office fantasy film, but he delivers a comic line where he corners Gandalf and says, what are you going to do now? Gandalf stabs him and he looks almost to camera and goes, yeah, that'll do it before he dies, and that apparently was just, you know, created just on the hoof like that. It's that sort of ability to do something like that and completely change the timber of a situation that I think really marks out great comic minds from the rest of us. And it is very sad, especially, you know, coming in the wake of uh, the sad demise of uh, Paul O'Grady and uh, his alter ego, Lily Savage. We've lost yeah. two you know, really sort of great characters in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but it is very nice to just refresh and to remember all all the good jokes that they did give us, because that does give us all a bit of a lift to remember uh, remember the comic geniuses that they were. Yeah, well, I've been watching uh, watching lots of clips um, this afternoon, including that one you mentioned. I think it was uh, it was Philip Schofield on this morning, wasn't it? Um, let's uh, move on to the front of the mirror and uh, a Boris Johnson story, uh, Rachel. Um, how would you uh, assess his his post number ten uh, a few months? Uh, I mean, what, what do you make of this one? I mean, first of all, just to link to um, Dave Medna briefly, uh, brilliant interview with Boris Johnson doing the rounds as well. Well, well worth watching. Definitely had his number. 
early on. Um, so he's living the life, isn't he? Um, zero consequences for what happened. He'll be fine. He's having one luxury holiday after another. He's got loads of very wealthy um, friends with very flash and fancy holiday homes around the globe. So he's just basically flitting from one to the other. This one is him and his family at a tycoon cousin's £4,100 a night villa, their fourth vacation in 10 months. Um, and it's the home of Sam Blythe, who um, helped the ex-Prime Minister secure a loan, uh, which was cred uh, connected to facilitating a credit line uh, to the BBC chief, Richard Sharp, um, over which a probe, over the appropriateness of that, which Sharp did not declare at the time, um, whether it's uh, okay or not, I would suggest not. Benedict, what do you make of this um, as, a, as a front page story? It's one of those things that sort of emerges. It's not entirely surprising that Boris Johnson would be living it up in La Maison Grande with you know the rich and powerful and famous, especially those of whom uh, he's already friendly and have helped him out in the past. This isn't particularly unusual behaviour from former heads of state. I think, you know, uh, Tony Blair used to holiday with Silvio Berlusconi whilst he was prime minister and also afterwards. You know, plenty of other people do it very famously. PMs end up on the sort of the after dinner circuit making as much money as they can. Uh, this is just a reminder, I think, of the bad old days of the Boris Johnson administration, which is not a period any of us necessarily want to look back on uh, with any fondness. Uh, the important thing, I think, is to remember that he's almost certainly now, as much as he may have believed that there was a comeback at some stage, potentially on the cards, this is not a man who is going to have high office again. Um, yeah, even for Boris Johnson, his powers of sort of a comeback would be pretty impressive. He managed that. And so, you know, uh, I just I just I, I wish him long life, health, happiness far away from me. And, you know, the old joke about Fiddler on the Roof and the Tsar, you know, just as long as he's not forcing right. you know policy on me that I disagree with, then uh, that, that he can do whatever he wants. Just OK, keep him, Benedict, keep we're out of time. Um, no indication of any wrongdoing, of course, by uh, Boris Johnson. And uh, we'll speak to you both again in half an hour. Thank you very much. Time